and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. This week's guest is a British explorer, filmmaker and writer, and a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Reza Pakravan is the first in modern history to travel the width of Africa via the Sahel, the semi-arid zone south of the Sahara Desert, and he holds the Guinness World Record for crossing the Sahara alone by bicycle. His passion is meeting indigenous people whose lives and cultures have remained unchanged for centuries, but whose reliance on nature is making them vulnerable in today's modern world. Reza first came to my attention when I watched his extraordinary four-part series, The World's Most Dangerous Borders, on Amazon. And he's got two more programmes on air at the end of this month, Shelter and Diamonds in the Sand. Hello Reza, how are you? Hi, Helen. Not too bad. How are you doing? Good. It feels nice to just see you in what looks like a safe and normal environment. (laughs) It kind of is, isn't it? Yeah, you probably saw me exploring war zones and being like out there. And now in my comfortable garden shed in North London. It looks a lot safer in your garden shed in North London. Now, I know from the emails that we've had backwards and forwards that you've been unbelievably busy. Tell us what you've been up to. Since the the show was launched, The World Most Dangerous Borders, since then I've got two more commissioning, which was really hard to win, you know, and it happened during COVID. So one was about an explorer traversing uh, Namibia's skeleton coast. She became the first woman who actually traversed the entire skeleton coast of Namibia, which made it to the four-part series for National Geographic and Outside TV in the States. And the second one is kind of a sad story. Uh, It's about COVID. It's called Shelter for Al Jazeera. Tell us a bit more about, first of all, going to the Skeleton Coast. That's really high up on my list, actually. I I don't want to be crossing the whole thing, but I would like to go to that part of the world. What was it like filming there? Funny enough is I didn't actually step in Skeleton Coast. I had to get a foreign crew to go there and shoot it for me because of travel restrictions. I haven't been able to travel myself. So we got a local crew, gave them all the briefing and yeah, we had to control them in distance and basically live the adventure vicariously through our, the eyes of our protagonist. How frustrating was that for you? Absolutely. I mean, the perk of the job is basically just get out there and explore these incredible places. And last year has been um, the massive uh, sort of blow to our spirits because we couldn't go there and, and film. And what were the challenges that your female faced? What were the main difficulties? She is a really, really incredible character. She's chased by hyenas. She passed through the desert, the territory of desert adapted lions, which, you know, pose incredible threat to her safety. She, you know, got lost in the middle of a sand sea in Namibia. It was absolutely incredible. So I was cutting this documentary and I was living this adventure through her. It was really, really painful to see her going through all of this. But yeah, she managed to finish it and it was absolutely incredible. It was a beautiful series at the end. I'm really, really proud of it. Yeah, so that was uh, Diamonds in the Sand. And what about Shelter? Tell us a bit about Shelter. Shelter, someone came and presented this story to me that a hospital in Iran, which we don't get to see much of it, is going through a very old hospital in a very impoverished part of Iran, and they are building a new hospital next to it. And the old hospital is running out of capacity due to the COVID overwhelming amount of COVID patients. And they want this half finished building, bring that half finished building online and basically make it operational to accommodate COVID patients. And they call that shelter. And the challenges to make that building was basically the building was unfinished. The, the, oxygen pipes weren't installed, the, the electricity wasn't wasn't there, and it was a half-finished building. So they had to create this sort of emergency, they have to go to this sort of emergency wiring, creating the emergency pipe for oxygen and that kind of sort of accommodate COVID patients. And during the whole process, all the workers wanted to desert the project because they were fearing of their safety because the new hospital is very close to the old hospital and they were seeing the dead bodies leaving the the old hospital and go dead bodies going to the morgue at the same time these guys are working and try to prepare this emergency shelter and it was a really moving story because an engineer it was a, it's a character driven story 
an engineer who was heading the site stood by the project and said, you know, whatever happens, I'm going to make this building finish and prepare it to accommodate 200 COVID patients. And he, he managed to pull it off. It was absolutely unbelievable. Again, you have to, you know, recruit foreign crew to just go there and shoot it. We couldn't go there due to travel restrictions. But yeah, uh, you know, sitting here and, you know, seeing all these COVID patients, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was really strange to, to see, you know, how people are being treated and in and out of the hospital. It was, it was really heartbreaking. And how did you come across that story in the first place, Reza? Someone pitched it to me. Someone said, you know, have this story. And I thought, wow, this is amazing because, you know, obviously Iran was one of the places that was hit really badly by COVID. And we haven't seen anything from inside. So it was a great access. Took it to Al Jazeera. They <laughs> took it to BBC first. And I went through the whole process of commissioning, which took forever. And I thought, okay, I'm going to lose the story. You know, I'm going to miss the whole juice and the shelter being built. So I went to Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera grabbed it immediately. And it goes on air on 29th of March. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that's not very far away. So I shall definitely watch Diamonds in the Sand and also Shelter. Before we dig deeper into your programmes and your extreme adventures when you're actually out there in the wilds of wherever, I'm fascinated to know how you became an explorer in the first place, because it definitely wasn't on my career sheet when I was at school. Neither are mine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I sort of grew up in a television family and my dad, since sort of an early age, he started taking me to wherever was possible during my summer holidays. He was making a documentary somewhere remote. He was always taking me with him and I got to travel a lot when I was a kid. And that planted the seed of traveling. And as I grew up, I was becoming more and more interested in remote places, remote communities and places and people that we don't get to see quite often. Another inspiration for me was Tintin. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Tintin. Oh, I'm sure you are. I love Tintin and Snowy. I grew up on all of that. There you go. And, you know, that was the big inspiration for me. I mean, the, yeah, it was my dad actually bought the, when I was nine ten he gave me as a birthday present the entire collections of Tintin and I traveled with Tintin as a little boy to the moon and back to the middle of Congo to South America to Arabia and that really sparked my imagination and you know if you look at Tintin and you think wow this is great just get me out there you know I just want to live his life you know and I started doing, combining my passion with storytelling and travel together and started to make this full, my full time career. It's fantastic. We uh, go to France quite often in the summer and in all the little markets, they sell the secondhand French Tintin cartoon books. And I just can't help myself. I mean, I just have to buy them and I don't speak French very well, but the cartoons are just so beautiful and they look fabulous in French as well. So no, very, very big Tintin fan. The World's Most Dangerous Borders is gripping. The clue is absolutely in the title. For those who haven't seen it, Reza, just explain a bit about it and the thinking behind it. If I summarise it in one sentence, is me travelling along the the world's most dangerous borders, uh, Africa's most volatile borders, to see the lives of who live there along those borders. And basically, the name is written on the tin. It came when I was traveling in Chad in 2018. What I saw there in Chad really blew my mind. And I realized how much we don't know about this region of the world, the Sahel uh, region, which is a sandwich, uh, is, is a belt that separating the Sahara Desert from African savannah. And I'm a member of Royal Geographical Society. I'm a um, fellow. And people in the Royal Geographical Society, they've been everywhere. It's very difficult to say I've been somewhere at the Royal Geographical Society and people would say, oh, yeah, we don't know anything about it. But I realized I went and did so much research when I came back from Chad about the Sahel region. And I realized there's not many people been there. It's very close to us. It's part of Africa. It's five hours away. There hasn't been many people traveling through this region. And that was my first question. And I realized no one has traveled through that region because this region has been locked to outsiders for a long time due to war, terrorism, political conflict. And it's been completely off limits. If you look at the Sahelian countries are all red zones by foreign office advice against all travel. And I decided to travel through them and tell the story of people who live there. 
And, you know, my job as an explorer and filmmaker to tell untold stories, that's, that's what keeps me awake at night. And this was a perfect opportunity to tell the story of those people who their stories otherwise won't get told. Are there times, though, that you are fearful for your life, Reza, because there are some really dramatic things that you come across in that programme? There were hairy moments, for sure. I was held at a gunpoint by human smugglers uh, because we were filming migrants who were leaving to Libya, trying to go through this hard desert, go to Libya and then on to Europe. That was really, really scary. We were filming, the human smugglers got really angry. They came at us with AK-47 and told us to bugger off, go away. That was really scary. And then we just had to go and pack up and leave immediately. Then I was thrown in jail at Darfur. We entered Sudan in a time that the, the old dictator Omar al-Bashir got toppled. We didn't know that because we were in the middle of nowhere. We were shooting and we didn't have access to outside world. It was so remote. So we entered from Chad to Sudan with all the permits, all the shooting permit, everything. And next thing we know, we were in, we entered Sudanese territory. We were taken to the military barracks. Next thing we know, we, we were handed over to the Sudanese intelligence and spent four days under detention in Darfur and then further questioning in Khartoum. We've got a little clip of that from the trailer, Reza. Let's just play that in. Day two from Darfur prison. Welcome to a ghetto. Blending in. It's just brutal. Around this part of the world, they don't hunt animals, they hunt humans. We are at the mercy of the mountains. Ow! Am I right in thinking, Reza, that your wife was pregnant when that happened? That's right, yes. So what went through your mind when you were incarcerated for a few days? It was horrible. The fact that I knew I'm going to be fine. Uh, what really bothered me was lack of contact with the outside world. I couldn't call her. I couldn't text her to say, I'm fine. You know, it's just, I'm not here for politics. I'm here to make a television series and tell the story of people. I'm not interfering with Sudanese government affairs. You know, I'm not reporting on human rights. So there is no sensitivity and I have all the permits here. The fact that I'm just being unlucky to enter the country in a bad time is just, you know, I've been unlucky. And I just wanted to tell her, but there wasn't any way to reach out to her. The phone signal wasn't working. There wasn't any place to, you know, make a phone call. The last day when I finally got the permission to go to United Nations compound to make a phone call, that was a moment of relief. After that, I went through a lot within that four days, the guilt and the pressure and feeling really selfish, you know, leaving my pregnant wife and, you know, venturing to these places, if I'm really honest. But she was very happy that hearing my voice and she kept it together really nicely. She must be a very special lady that she's, you know, she, I'm presuming. She's she, a special lady and I'm a very lucky person. I presume she knows how much it means to you to get these stories out to the wider population. I think we've got another part of that trailer, which will just give us a real sense of the dangers that sometimes you do face. Moments like this, beyond description. Everybody's crying, we have five people dead. They want us to go with the army vehicle. Our every single move is being monitored. They go to Libya. All them, all them. Look how many people are in this truck. They're really paranoid about our security. Quite an uncomfortable position to be in. It seems to be that we are targets. I just want to get out of here with for peace. This is absolutely awe-inspiring. We're burning. Just look at this. This is adventure at its ultimate. I mean, these stories that you discover along the way, we'll talk about indigenous tribes and other aspects of what you do in a moment, but they have to be told, don't they? And it takes somebody like you and a brave crew and a guide to go in there because otherwise we'd never know what goes on. That's absolutely true. And, you know, to get to those stories, it requires a huge amount of time and effort, you know, putting it together and, you know, building trust with the people on the ground 
to get you to those places that no one else has been or no one else has access to those stories. And that goes basically to sort of a bit of a people skills and be able to convince people on the other side of the phone that you don't have any hidden agenda. You're really honest and you really have a genuine reason to go there and tell those stories. And it took me two years of development to get this off the ground because of that. This was the most difficult program to make because of the shooting, it was easy once you're there, but developing it, building those contacts on the ground to get you to places that you want to go, that was the key. And that was the whole difficulty came from. Now, if you're Tintin in all this, Snowy has got to be Henry, your wonderful <laughs> guide. I think I've fallen slightly in love with him. I'm completely taken by him. He's a very, very special man, isn't he? Tell us a bit about Henry, who guides you through when you're in Africa. I met Henry first when I was in Chad filming. There wasn't any place to stay. We were at the Lake Chad, which is like stone throw away from the border of Nigeria at really sort of a very uh, front line of battle with Boko Haram. And there was one UN compound that all the journalists and filmmakers, the documentary maker would stay there. And the one compound which belonged to Oxfam. So Henry rocked up and uh, we saw each other there. It was a really grim environment. And Henry just lit up the whole environment by his presence. He was really calm. He's a consultant. So he advises humanitarian organizations or guys like UN or I don't know, mining companies to set up operation in conflict zones. So places that no one goes, Henry is the first one on the ground building all the local contacts and facilities for big organizations to set up there. I couldn't think of anyone better than him to be my guide. He's speaking 10 different dialects, French, English, great guy, great sense of humor, great on camera. And I thought, oh, will you be my guide on this show? And he kindly accepted. And problem with Henry, I mean, not a problem, is a great thing about Henry is he's vegan. And, you know, trying to find food for Henry in the middle of uh, nowhere, <laughs> but, you know, to, to comply with his vegan diet was extremely difficult. But he was incredible. The way that he really adapted himself with it situations and you know he was a big asset for us and it looks like there's a deep trust and a bond that's developed between you because when you're traveling to places like that i guess you need to have a relationship like that with somebody you really trust don't you that's true and because you know going to places like that it's very special it's kind of a powerful thing when you when you go somewhere that the people in the village have never seen a foreigner for decades no one has actually stepped in that village and is really powerful. And we experienced some really, really dangerous moments as well as really uplifting moments together. And that bond, that friendship, you know, is going to stay forever because, you know, when you're depending on each other to that level, bring you very close to each other. So tell us about some of your favorite indigenous tribes that you've come across. And do you feel Reza really privileged to meet people who the vast majority of us will never have chance to see. Absolutely. I mean, this is a very, very privileged position and I'm not taking it for granted. This has been my passion all my life and I've worked really hard towards it. This is really what makes me tick. And, you know, going to see incredible cultures and people that have remained unchanged for centuries. I'll give you an example. We went to see a tribe called the Vudabi in Chad. They are polygamous tribe and practice polygamy and they are sexually liberated by which women, married women, can take any man as sexual partner. Whether that man is married or unmarried, doesn't matter. Whether it's for a brief affair or a long-term partnership. But the key is if the woman decides to leave her husband, she has to leave the kids with the husband and go to become a wife of someone else. And there is no stigma attached to it. It's completely accepted in the Vudabi culture. And you think you just go there and you see this nomadic tribe, which are incredibly beautiful, gorgeous tattoo with incredible calabash and great embroidery art, artifact, um, part of their lifestyle. They, they're constantly on the move. You really go and spend a month with these people and you just think this is 
just mind blowing. This is such a fascinating modern way of thinking for such an ancient culture. And the other thing you look at, apart from when you see fairly eye opening things like that, I know that you also look at the tribes and set their life against our climate change problem and see how climate change is affecting their day to day life. That's another important strand of all this for you, isn't it? That has been a passion and focus over the last few years. I'm highly passionate about indigenous people around the world and I've seen in the Amazon and the headwaters of the Amazon how the lives of uncontacted tribes and people who have just came to contact the Amazonian tribe in general has been in huge jeopardy because of illegal logging or mining or forces of outside world sort of a, in the face of modernity. And, you know, I've seen the same pattern to be repeated again across the Sahel. I've seen how climate change and desertification across the Sahel, global warming has led to mass migration and devastation of many indigenous people. They have to leave their lands. They have to migrate to other places in search of new pastures led them to war led them to you know leave their home and these are really devastating things to see and you traveled didn't you 4000 miles through the amazon rainforest known isn't it as so called lungs of the earth what did you discover on that journey a lot. The first thing I discovered is that the idea of the romantic idea of the Amazon that we are having in mind of a bunch of guys running around naked with bow and arrow, that doesn't exist. The first tribe that we met were called Tembe. Enter Tembe territory. To my shock, they had Wi-Fi, flat screen television, and they were listening to Adele. <laughs> That was brilliant. Took me about two and a half months to get to the headwaters of the waters of the Amazon and see actual indigenous people that I had in mind in primary forest away from the forces of modern life, you know, eating monkeys and all the sort of things that you imagine of a tribe in the middle of the Amazon, you know, eating monkeys or taking ayahuasca for their, you know, retreat and healing process, all the things that you so on sort of Bruce Parry's stuff ages ago. It took me about, you know, two and a half months to be able to see all of those. And what I discovered was, you know, the life of indigenous people around the world is really sort of vulnerable because they rely on the nature and the imposition of the modern world and, you know, the, the forces of modernity and using natural resources, putting a huge amount of pressure on the nature. Hence, their livelihood is in danger. And is it too late, Reza? I mean, have we gone too far? Can we pull back from the brink? The answer is I don't know. I really don't know if it definitely would be amazing if you can put a stop into it. But whether the damage is done or not, I mean, Amazon is, to me, is a lost cause. It's gone. Tiny bit of a primary forest left, an area of as big as like Belgium, Luxembourg. Um, so tiny. But the rest has been destroyed and is, is being destroyed. And it's great. We sit here in, in the Western world and we say, oh, yeah, the Brazilian government, you know, should, you know, take more steps in, in terms of protecting the Amazon. But we are the one that buying their cows, buying the cattle. We are the one that use mahogany trees in our artifacts. We are the ones that consume soybeans and all that kind of stuff that really, these are the monocultures that destroy the Amazon. They cut the trees and plant monoculture. So all of these things, you know, unless we address it in a sort of very holistic way, you know, putting pressure on one country, especially a poor country, it's not going to work. If my kids are hungry, I will go and cut the entire rainforest to feed them. That's an issue. How do you cope with the emotional side of things? I'm thinking perhaps when you were travelling through the Central African Republic and I saw the child slaves fishing in really hot temperatures and my little 11-year-old was shocked to see them sort of living in what looked like tents made out of black bin liners. I think it made him feel very lucky to be here, but very troubled by what he saw. How do you feel, particularly as I know you have a young baby now, does it really tug on your heartstrings and are there moments when, I don't know, perhaps you have a few tears about the stuff you see? It does, doesn't it? It really feels heavy sometimes and, you know, just don't want to be so dramatic, but it takes a couple of weeks to adjust to normal life because what you've seen, it was very difficult to digest. Now I have a kid, it's even more difficult to digest that sort of things. You know, you think, oh yeah, well, I have all these privileges. My baby has cupboard full of clothes and he's fussy over different types of cereal. That's, you know, what, different type of food. 
I've seen people that, you know, they don't have anything to eat, malnutrished little babies. Is there any justice to this? So those are the questions you always ask. I suppose the great thing is, though, that you going in with a film crew and, you know, at times risking your life to get the footage you get, you are getting the stories out there, which is really, really important and presumably helpful in the long term to raise awareness. What I love about your programme as well is one minute you're in danger and then you're with an incredible Indigenous tribe who are wearing the most extraordinary outfits in the middle of nowhere, which always always makes me wonder where on earth they get them from. They look incredible when they put on perhaps a ceremony for you or whatever. But also I loved it when you visited, for example, the UNESCO site built out of mud. I'm going to get this wrong. The Great Mosque of Jen? Jen M. Jen Jen M? Yep. Tell us a bit about that and how the kids have to get the mud to rebuild it every year, because that was fantastic telly. Oh my God, I can't, I can never forget that. I, the best way to, to describe it, Nautical Carnival slash Glastonbury Festival slash Burning Man, all <laughs> washed up together, planting Mali with tons of mud added to it. So that's the best description. So every year, the people of Jenne, uh, it's a city of mud, a city built on everything is muddy. The houses, everything built with mud. So every year, the people of Jenne and across Mali, they come to the city to give the mosque a new skin to prepare it for the rainy season. So plaster it with new mud. So cover all the cracks and holes and everything. And this mosque means everything to them. So the party starts two days before the plastering. There's a whole shebang in terms of the the whole ceremony in run up to the plastering. People dance and play music and there's DJ. There are, you know, parties across the town and in the run up to plastering, everything is happening. So the mud is piling up across the outskirts of the town. And then on the day, different groups have different pits assigned to them. They just go and grab mud and just bring them to the mosque and then they give it to the masons and the masons start plastering the mosque and the whole operation is just so incredible and just the whole thing finishes with a huge dance and parties a street party and people are dancing like proper festival it's like good old-fashioned rave they, they just go for it <laughs> you gave us the tv view a real sense of actually what went on but it must have been an incredible atmosphere actually being there one thing that struck me planning the small adventures which are not really adventures next to what you do but for me it's all about preparation how do you go about preparing for such mammoth journeys and is a lot of it in the prep before you head off on the plane and go off to your first destination? Yeah, I have to say preparation is the key. And the best place to start is always the map and a glass of whiskey. That's the starting <laughs> point for me. But in especially in this situation, I had to resort to bottles of whiskey because it was very complicated. So it's a good excuse. Obviously, when you have a budget, when you have a safety of the crew, you know, as a producer, you got to think about every single aspects of the production and you can't just, you know, rock up there and you come back with nothing, especially with this type of programs. I don't like to overproduce, but at least 60% of what I'm going to get, it has to be already secured and in the can, you know, the access to people, the places, the interviews and and characters. So the pre-production of a TV series like this takes a huge amount of time and personnel. So it requires a team of researchers, producers, assistant producers, you know, production managers, all these people come together to, to sort of create this piece of television that you, you see. I mean, I, I don't need to tell you, you, you know, it, you know, it all. But when you're out there, it comes across as very intimate. I'm guessing you're working with a very small film crew, are you, when you're in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, our pre-production crew was bigger than our people on the ground. So we had one driver, one fixer, Henry, myself, sound man and a cameraman. And actually that intimacy comes across. I think that's a, a real asset. You feel like you are taking us, it's you taking us, not a massive film production company taking us. The other thing I wanted to just touch on is cycling, because 10 years ago, you earned yourself a Guinness record cycling across the Sahara. My question, Reza, 
is why. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I just wanted to establish a name for myself uh, as an adventurer. So I thought, okay, the best way to do this, let's get a Guinness World Record in the can and, you know, establish myself a name to be relevant in the world of adventure. So I've decided to do something that hasn't been done before. Wow, but searing heat and the punishing desert conditions. I mean, crumbs, what was it like? It was horrible. <laughs> you know, uh, I was living the dream. I was thinking, oh, wow, this is amazing. But that dream lasts for two days because the dream was really horrible. I was constantly falling off my bike. I was bruised and battered and sunburned and... I faced sandstorm in my life for the first time, which I didn't know what to do with it. So the wall of sand coming and hit you in the face and there's nothing you can do about it apart from dock and you know, cover your head with a, with a piece of scarf and wait for it to pass and then spend a couple of hours cleaning up the sands from every piece of equipment. Oh, you just got a rucksack with cooking equipment and a small tent. Is that how you go about something like that? Because you're on your own, weren't you? There, there are roads, but mainly camel tracks and sort of hard sand. I find it very difficult to cycle over the dunes, so I had to go around them. I had a guide who had a camel who was carrying the water. It was impossible and loads. So the camels are extremely fast, probably faster than a bicycle in, in the sand. <laughs> so <laughs> they were my support crew. And the funny thing was we didn't have any common language to speak to each other and communicate. So it was, the communication was completely based on universal sign language, if you like. He was a, a Bedouin man in the middle of Algeria and he got me through. He was absolutely incredible dude. Him and his father, they used to call them Sultan of the Sahara because whoever got lost in the Sahara, these guys would go and rescue them. And he got me through the Sahara desert with camel carrying my uh, water and meals and uh, yeah all the ration packs was on on the back of a camel and I was on my bicycle. I imagine that's a big physical challenge was it a big mental challenge as well? Yeah it was mentally challenging because it's bloody boring you know staring at the you know sand sand dunes over and over again after a while it just okay it's all the same <laughs> you know what I'm saying it's that monotony really kills you but yeah the nice part of it was at night we could start a fire and really enjoy ourselves by the fire I have a cup of tea you know made in it sort of a bedouin style that was a highlight of the day and how long did it take you and what did it feel like when you crossed your imaginary finish line if you like it was about two weeks and yeah I th there was no one at the finish line to you know i'm sorry <laughs> Give my get my uh, autograph you know it was myself and my guide and you know the camels they just did uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite uplifting especially when you realize you're far more capable than you think you are it really pushed my limits and the results were great the world is beginning to open up now thank goodness what's next for you reza I have a couple of projects in development. My personal projects, one is Orange River, which is the longest river in Southern Africa. And I'm going to do source to sea, start in Lusatho and finish in the mouth of the Orange River at Namibia. So that's in the process of development at the moment and pitching. So I've travelled a lot, Reza, but I've never actually been to the main parts of Africa. I've been to Morocco and trekked through the Atlas Mountains, actually with eight blind people, which was an incredible thing to do. But if you're looking for a bag carrier on your latest trip, then you've got my number. I'm looking for a guy who can take the pressure off me and present and front the programme so I can just get behind the camera and just focus on the production. <laughs> I don't know about being a great presenter, but I'll give it I'll give it a go for you. Reza, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. I can't wait to see your new programmes that are coming out at the end of this month. And thank you for being so generous, sharing some of those incredible adventures with us. And we also hope you're enjoying the challenges of being a relatively new dad. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to explorer and filmmaker Reza Pakravan. If you haven't watched The World's Most Dangerous Borders on Amazon, then I'd highly recommend you do. And do check out Reza's two new programmes that are coming up very soon. Thanks very much for listening to this week's Convex Conversation. You can download the series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts or ask Alexa. Bye for now.